Good afternoon. Welcome to our program, Grid Hardening and Resiliency, Strengthening North Carolina's Ability to Recover from Natural Disasters. My name is Deb Wojcik and I represent the Research Triangle Clean Tech Cluster. I want to begin by thanking all of you for joining us today and extend a special thanks to our moderator and panelists. We appreciate your time and willingness to share your knowledge with us. We know grid hardening is an important topic for utilities, municipalities, and renewable energy companies, and we're excited to bring you this conversation today. So before we move to the event itself, I wanna take care of a few house, housekeeping items. First, today, during today's event, attendees will be in listen-only mode, and we are recording the event to share with others. We have reserved 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A toward the end of the panel. Please feel free to submit questions for the panelists using the Q&A function throughout the discussion, and we will address as many as possible during the designated Q&A time. Those of you familiar with attending RTCC events in person, know that we enjoy facilitating connections to spur business development opportunities, partnerships, and learning. To that end, we're excited to offer a virtual networking with you at the conclusion of the panel from 2 to 2.15 p.m. today. We encourage you to participate and hope each of you will make a valuable connection. We will leverage the chat feature of Zoom to facilitate this networking among participants. Those interested in virtual networking received an email from Emmett Owens yesterday afternoon and again today just before the event with the names and affiliations of those interested in participating. Out of respect for our presenters and other participants, we ask that you please privately message the individual you wish to connect with and refrain from connecting until the conclusion of the panel. Thank you for this. So now that the housekeeping is out of the way and before I turn it over, to our moderator, Dr. Christopher Gaelic, I want to provide some information about the Research Triangle Clean Tech Cluster, or RTCC. We can go to the next slide. We are a membership-driven nonprofit focused on accelerating the growth of clean tech in the Research Triangle and North Carolina. We wouldn't be here without our members. I encourage you to check out our website to learn more. RTCC is nearing the end of a three-year U.S. Economic Development Administration grant focused on developing the North Carolina Clean Tech Corridor with Jules Accelerator, our Charlotte-based partner. Applications for Cohort 9 startups are being accepted now until October 29th, and we hope you will join us for Cohort 8's graduation on November 10th. Again, I encourage you to check out their website to learn more. I also wanna make you aware of RTCC's upcoming Clean Tech Innovation Awards, a celebration of the many exciting things happening in clean tech in North Carolina. Award nominations end on October 20th and sponsorship opportunities and event registration for the December 8th event are now open. In addition to the events listed here, I encourage you to keep your eye out for some additional virtual events we are organizing and hope to announce in the coming weeks. It is now my great pleasure to turn the program over to our moderator, Dr. Christopher Gaelic, Associate Professor for, of Public Administration in the School of Public and International Affairs at NC State University, and a public policy analyst with strengths in experimental ex economic policy, focusing on climate and low carbon energy policy. Thank you, Christopher, for leading this important conversation focused on grid hardening and resiliency. And now I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. I appreciate that. So as was said, my name is Christopher Gallick, uh, and I'd like to jump right in here. As we've all seen, outages caused by major natural disasters like hurricanes, wildfires, winter storms are often in the news, but those headlines obscure the complex role that countless entities play in enhancing grid reliability and resilience and the behind the scenes work that they do to plan and prepare. 
Today, we have the benefit of hearing from four individuals from various perspectives working to promote reliability and resilience here in North Carolina. I believe that we'll have bios available for each in the, in the chat at some point. So in the interest of time, I'll simply introduce each in the order they'll provide their own take on grid hardening and resiliency, specifically responding to the question of what does grid hardening and resiliency mean to you and how do you and your organization fit in? Following initial takes on that, we'll hopefully have some time for questions and conversation. So first we'll have Michael Johnson. Mike is Manager of Customer Delivery Program Development and Governance at Duke Energy. Next will be Greg Cohn, Vice President of Engineer at Four, Vice President of Engineering, excuse me, at Four County Electric Membership Corporation or EMC. Following Greg will be Todd Jackson. Todd is Vice President of Sales with Power Secure. And last but certainly certainly not least is David Williamson, Utilities Engineer with the Public Staff, North Carolina Utilities Commission. So without further ado, Mike, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us uh, at this presentation today. What I wanted to do just before we jump into the topic a little bit about uh, grid hardening and resiliency is talk a little, about, a little bit about what Duke Energy is doing for grid improvements here in North Carolina. I'll give a couple examples of reliability improvements and resilience resiliency improvements, but I also wanted to let you know that we are working on expanding solar and renewables on the grid in our distribution circuits. There's new technologies that comes along with that. We're working hard to enable that two-way power flow on our circuits. And we're also adding devices that can help us communicate to sensors on the grid so we can manage the, that integration well. And on the bottom left, you'll know that uh, our customers expect more from us these days around options and control of, of their energy choices. We'll talk about uh, the information that we can provide to communities as we prepare for these major events and how we can improve the system to be more resilient. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Well, let's talk about definitions. Uh, I thought this would be a great slide to start with. We talk about reliability, Great hardening and resiliency, but what does that mean? Well, great hardening is really about outage prevention. And we do a lot of basic blocking and tackling in this space to prevent that outage from happening in the first place. What are some good examples? Well, we have to replace poles and conductors as they age. We've got to do tree trimming uh, to prevent those uh, trees from coming down on our power lines. And we all know that uh, mother nature can't be controlled we know that North Carolina experiences its fair share of hurricanes and tropical storms. We have flood events that come along with those, uh, those hurricanes. And we have winter storms with snow and ice. So together uh, with these improvements, we're looking to prevent those outages from happening in, in the first place. Let's talk about resiliency a little bit. That's all about uh, restoring power as quickly as we can when outages do happen. Uh, particularly in major events, we know that getting the power back on can really help our communities respond well, uh, get businesses back up and running, get those critical services to, to the citizens of an area, and improve communications in, on, the, on the travel. So if we could go to the next slide, please. The first example I wanted to share with you today was a substation improvement we're working to, to strengthen the grid. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see substations are a critical link between our, our transmission and distribution systems. And that's where the power flows into the communities down the roads to serve our houses. In this example on the left, you can see the Grifton substation. It's in the eastern part of the state. And the top left picture uh, is an example of what happened during Hurricane Matthew a few years ago. Uh, we installed uh, some temporary pro flood protection there. And in 2020, we put some permanent flood walls up around that substation. What does that do? Well, that helps the, the substation stay up and running during a flood event. And it also protects the equipment. So we, we have less um, issues inside the substation if water does get inside. If you could take a look at the next slide, we'll, we'll show you what that looks like uh, from an engineering perspective. During uh, hurricanes, Matthew and Florence, we experienced about five to six feet of flood waters at that location. So this flood wall gives us about 
eight to nine feet of vertical clearance on the top above the ground, and it goes 18 feet below ground. The design protection is about six feet total there. So we expect this improvement will help us keep that Krypton community served well at, if there is another future flooding event. Uh, let's go to the last slide and let's talk about resiliency. The smart thinking grid. So uh, if you think about a GPS, a good analogy for this is the GPS device that maybe 10 years ago, you would be going from point A to point B and you might encounter some traffic along the way. Uh, a smarter GPS device today is able to recognize that there's a traffic issue ahead of you and reroute you to your destination a little bit faster, a little bit quicker than the older devices. That's a good analogy for our smart thinking grid today. We sometimes call it self-optimizing grid. We sometimes call it a self-healing team. But basically what it's doing is when that outage occurs, it isolates that outage on our system, it evaluates alternative solutions to reroute power and gets as many customers as we can on within a quick period of time typically within two, two to five minutes. So this is a backbone technology for Duke as we think about resiliency on our distribution system. That's the last slide I had. So I'll toss it back to Chris. Thank you, Mike, I appreciate that. Um, next we have Ta uh, Greg Cohn, excuse me. Hi there. <clears throat> uh, I'm Greg Cohn. I'm the VP of Engineering here at Fort County. Uh, I got to warn you, I am not a professional speaker, so you have to bear with me. Um, Mike did a great job uh, of intro into kind of what I want to talk about when you talk about flooding. Um, if you would go to the next slide for me. <clears throat> normally, um, again, I'm not really sure with the audience. Normally, when we have hurricanes and storms and even storm surges, this is the utility picture you see, right? It's you know, a pole fell over and we talk about stuff like this with hardening and resilience. It's like, it's like uh, Mike was saying, you look at this pole, you say, hey, can we make it out of steel or concrete? Can we make it stronger or whatever? Um, <clears throat> but the point I want to show about this is you can get to this pole. Um, so, and, and the utilities are really good at getting stuff back on when they can get to it. Can you go to the next slide? So. Um, Here's the problem we've been facing lately here in, um, in Southeast North Carolina, is um, this road here was passable. There was not a drop of water on this bridge six hours before this photo was taken. Um, so we got our crews on one side, came back, you know, and we came back, we couldn't get over it. Um, what we have the problem here is, is extreme long-term flooding. Can you go to the next page for me? I only got six slides, so it's okay. Um, so bear with me, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, and this is Highway 53, kind of near, Bur no, I'm sorry, that one there, yeah. This is Highway 53, uh, kind of near Birdall, North Carolina. This road stayed flooded for days. Um, so if you go to the next slide, is, is a little bit I want to talk about today is, um, and luckily there's only two more slides, is um, flooding and more importantly, long-term flooding has really made us rethink our hardening resilience. It's like uh, Michael was showing, we've done similar things with our substations, uh, raising equipment, um, um, planning, um, changing the, the, the way that we restore power. You know, historically, you know, every utility does that. We will bring the most members on um, the quickest, you know, whoever gets the biggest bang for the buck. But we've actually found that what we need to do is we need to go into areas, put the poles and wire back up before the flooding occurs. Um, from Hurricane Florence, that 20 and 30 inches of rain that fell up near Raleigh all came down to us two, three, four, five days later. So we needed to get in, fix stuff, and then get out before the floods came down. Um, the other thing we found is that underground's not the panacea for resilience and hardening that a lot of, a lot of us thought it was. Um, a lot of underground equipment is not designed to be underwater and under four, five, six, seven feet of water for days. So it's really, um, it's definitely changed the way we, we look at stuff and how we've planned. We've actually spent a lot of time the last three years uh, redoing a lot of it. And if you go to the last slide, the last thing I wanna mention is um, the other piece 
that um, that really got us was uh, for about a day and a half, the town of Burgall and the surrounding area, and actually even Wilmington, were cut off from the rest of the world. So we used contractors trying to get material and stuff in. We couldn't get people here. Um, didn't have a place to keep them. You know, food, fuel, material. So it, when we talk about hardening, it, it is that uniform thing. It's not four counties sitting out here saying, how do we get our grid hardened and resilient? It's how do we get the entire infrastructure that supports our communities um, hardened and more resilient? And the last piece I put in there is we actually lost communication equipment because it got flooded. And uh, it was a really interesting um, event for us. Um, and that's the last of my slides. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. I think that that really drives home some of the challenges here, and I really appreciate your perspective on that. Uh, next, we have Todd Jackson with PowerSecure. Thank you. Um, so go to the next slide. So um, at PowerSecure, we really work in support of the utility. So we're not a utility, but we provide uh, resiliency solutions. So what we believe is that everybody should have the ability to control their destiny uh, in achieving their individual energy goals. And that takes the form of a lot of resiliency goals. So sustainable, resilient uh, supply of energy um, supplement, supplemental there because we, we supplement the grid. So if the grid's not down, the customer has resilient supply of uh, energy, sustainable supply of energy. It's when these natural disasters that uh, have been discussed or someone hitting a utility pole by accident with their car or animal uh, interference with maybe killing a transformer or, or chewing through wire. So we put that resiliency and solu uh, solution in place at the customer uh, location behind the customer meter, which we also say we want to uh, reduce their operating expense, which, which comes in with if there are load management programs that they can participate uh, in with the, with the utility for maybe capacity driven programs or um, we cover the entire United States. So we operate in the ISO RTO markets where there's capacity programs as well, but using that resilient energy solution that we can put in place to help provide a uh, larger or greater return on investment other than just keeping the power on. And we're environmentally conscious. So uh, we believe that, um, that providing these solutions with uh, environmentally responsible energy assets is, uh, is what we should be doing as well. So next slide. Uh, so to expand on that behind the meter, that really is our primary focus of putting community microgrids. We have, uh, we've won two awards for, for doing community microgrids, one in uh, Eastern North Carolina, or kind of around the Raleigh area, one in uh, Alabama that we uh, installed advanced microgrid, uh, which definition of the advanced microgrid is more than one energy device. So there was uh, element of renewables, energy storage, and reciprocating engines for their own needs. Uh, all of it was pointed towards resiliency, but with the uh, ability to participate in time of use rates or use the battery for the utilities needs for frequency or voltage response needs. And then the reciprocating engine uh, to provide the resiliency aspect. We're fulfilling those three goals that we see most often, which is the environmentally friendly energy assets, able to participate in energy markets so that they can recoup, it, the customer can recoup expense for the installation of the microgrid. And then the, the pure resiliency aspect of having that um, backup generator in place, whether that's tier four final diesel uh, engine or a, uh, EPA certified natural gas engine, which the diesel engines we have tested to where they can run on renewable diesel, again, offering a very environmentally friendly uh, aspect of resiliency or run on uh, renewable natural gas so that uh, you can further that uh, environmental responsibility. Uh, we do 
uh, from time to time offer projects or solutions that are at the distribution level for um, for utilities where they want to uh, provide more customers on an individual feeder off of a substation, a uh, resiliency solution. And again, um, we don't ever perceive that there's a utility sustainable supply of energy problem. Uh, there's a uh, growing storm problem across the United States, several pretty damaging storms this year that uh, we had assets at customers that allowed them to get back online and continue to run their facilities for what the mission of that facility is very quickly uh, after the uh, after the power outage. Uh, next slide. We also believe that we're unique in the in the industry of being able to provide a design, build, own, operate, maintain solution as one company. Um, a lot of systems integrators out there where they take commercially available parts and pieces to come up with their solutions. Uh, we manufacture the vast majority of our solutions, test them at our facility in Durham. We have our own construction crews um, monitoring. So there's ability to, um, to show the customer that when the asset or the solution is needed, it's going to be there. Uh, we have our own service organization and advanced analytics, which uh, helps us to continue uh, to improve the products that are involved in our solutions and the performance of those solutions in the marketplace. I'll turn it back over to you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Todd. I appreciate that, uh, particularly um, giving voice to how microgrids can be an important part of, of resiliency. Uh, again, last but certainly not least, we have David Williamson, public staff with the North Carolina Utilities Commission. Sure. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you just go to the next slide, please? So kind of unlike the other guys on this panel, my perspective is going to be from the lens of a regulator and not from the from an in the field type of view. So for those who don't know who we are, uh, public staff, uh, we were created through General Statute 1977 uh, to represent the using and consuming public and provide insight and expertise in matters that come before the, the Utilities Commission. Um, as a note, we are completely separate from the Commission and their staff, meaning once the, correct, once the record is closed and decision making begins uh, on a matter at hand, our commenting, just like with, the, with other parties, is over. Also down at the bottom, I'll note my disclaimer that anything I say here today is pretty much just my own opinion and not to be interpreted or reflect policy of public staff or North Carolina. Next slide. So what I have here are uh, three, sorry, three components that uh, make up the majority of my agency's purview for this topic. And there's, there's planning, there's modeling slash justification, and there's affordability slash the cost to customers. Next slide. So how we plan our state's energy future has been evolving at a fast pace over the last decade, uh, with the focus shifting toward distribution planning, the electric IOUs are having to figure out ways to best determine where those needs are greatest during any given year. Currently, we have Duke Energy developing an, an integrated system, an operational plan, an ISOP model, and then Dominion is also working on its own grid transformation plan. Next slide. So how we model and what is given, given weight in those models is also evolving. Utilities and government agencies are working to determine appropriate values to better guide the planning aspect of building resiliency while also addressing policy goals. Next slide. And lastly, affordability to customers and how fast utility spending should be towards addre toward addressing resiliency uh, is a constant state of discussion between all parties. Next slide. And that's, that's all I have. Just contact information here pretty quick. Thank you, David. 
Well, I think uh, something just happened that's never happened in any panel that I've been, been involved with, and that's that we finished ahead of schedule. Um, usually these things run way longer and we have to claw back time for questions and answers. I think that we're lucky enough that um, that we actually have plenty of time now. I see one in the Q&A that came in uh, that's for Greg in particular, but I wanna actually piggyback onto, I think a question that touches on everything that was said here. So the question in the Q&A is, excuse me for the read, does Four County EMC own and operate its own generators? And how, how has your supply contract with Duke impacted your ability to implement grid hardening measures? So Greg, that's a question for you, but I think to broaden it out, um, and I'll, I'll turn the floor over here in just a sec, but to broaden it out for, uh, for all of our panelists today, there's this issue of, of collaboration and coordination. So how important is collaboration in grid hardening and resiliency, both from a prevention standpoint and also a recovery standpoint? There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of people involved. So how does it all work together? But we'll start with that specific question for, for Greg. Um, great question. Uh, Four County does not own our own generation. Um, Four County in, in, um, in conjunction with like 20 some other co-ops formed um, what we call statewide organization. It's North Carolina Electric Membership Corporation. Uh, we banded together. They actually are our wholesale power provider contractually buying the bulk of it from Duke, but they actually have uh, their powers, power supply contract directly with Duke. We have what's essentially, uh, essentially an all powers require, all requirements power supply agreeing with our statewide organization. Um, our statewide organization and Duke work hand in hand and, and closely on all the grid hardening and discussions with that. Um, we actually work with statewide, we work with Duke um, on these efforts because we're dependent as everybody in the eastern part of the state is, uh, in southeast part, on the Duke transmission grid. I mean, everybody, the municipals, Duke themselves, and the co-ops all depend on, on the grid, the transmission grid to give us power. Maybe I'll, I'll jump in here, Chris. Um, on the topic of collaboration, I, I think it's, it's super key, especially during these major events that, that we've talked about. Some of these hurricanes have been quite substantial. There's been a lot of coordination that has to happen with our local state government officials, our, our co-op partners. Uh, we need to stay in close contact with them. And it, it's important to do that during the event itself. And it's also important to do that in preparation during storm drills and, and be prepared for those moments. Uh, you don't wanna learn on the fly, right? So um, by doing uh, these storm drills, by hearing from our community leaders, hearing from our, our partners in this effort, it's, uh, collaboration is super important. Todd or David, did you have any uh, comments on, on this idea of collaboration and coordination? Uh, not so much in North Carolina with the uh, with the cooperatives, but with the municipal utilities in North Carolina, we have probably the largest part of our installed base in support of generation behind the customer meter. Um, so, what I really mean by that is the utility serves the the commercial industrial customer behind the delivery point. We'll put in a resiliency solution. That um, that they can rely on when there's a uh, one of these storms that uh, that Michael and, and Greg are discussing. You know, we can't outrun floods like you're talking about, so we have to put mitigation in place for the uh, assets getting flooded. But uh, as long as we can get fuel to the assets while the utility works on their restoration, we're able to supply supply, uh, supply power to to those behind the meter customers. So another question that just came in is about uh, technology. So uh, Charlie asked, do you foresee a need for cost-effective real-time monitoring of distribution transformers, utility poles, and remote substations? Today, this has been done by boots on the ground inspection. This kind of gets to a broader question of, of what type of technology solutions can help to increase resiliency. Um, particularly, are there things that you'd like to see deployed, um, maybe that have been used in particular places, but you see uh, broader opportunities for deployment? So obviously, some of the real-time monitoring that Charlie's asking about, but also, are there other things that you're seeing in your work? Um, Mike, you showed the example of, of the flood protection works there. Uh, Todd, 
you're obviously in this base in this business um, on the microgrid side. Greg, you talked about planning and trying to to uh, to bring things back online um, in in new and in different ways based upon the the conditions on the ground. What sort of changing technologies do you see playing a role here? Specifically, the monitoring monitoring on our microgrid installations. We have twenty four seven. Uh, monitoring all of all of the critical aspects of those solutions so that uh, we can see real time in our network operations center uh, alarms. We can clear alarms. We can dispatch our uh, service organization to uh, ensure that those assets are up and, and operational. Uh, we connect with the utility SCADA systems a lot of times so that we can, um, we can automatically start when we see power outages or when power outages occur. Uh, we can run in advance of storms by connecting to uh, weather systems. So as long as you have those uh, EPA certified assets, um, a lot of our customers, especially closer to the, uh, to the East Coast, uh, they'll run half a day in advance of approaching storm just to make sure that they have bumpless transfer uh, from if the grid goes out to, uh, to the assets that we have in place. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll add a comment or two here. I think, uh, you know, traditionally in these situations, we've used SCADA systems, as, as Todd mentioned, as a key component to understanding what's going on on the grid. Um, we've, we're constantly adding devices that can help us with that assessment. But we also, uh, I think, ultimately will have a, a mix of boots on the ground and that real-time assessment from additional sensors. Those sensors will uh, continue to uh, add additional value to that initial assessment. We, we really need to understand what parts of the grid are down, what parts of the, where the outages are, and that can really help us address where do you send the boots uh, on that initial assessment. And that really informs us where to send the construction crews and the repair crews. So it's a, it's a journey, I think, uh, and we ultimately are continually going to learn how to best approach the damage assessment phase of storm restoration and sensors, additional sensors can help us uh, do that quickly and efficiently at the very beginning of a storm. So I think your AMI network helps tremendously there too, right? Because you're getting real-time feed from the meter of uh, who's who has power and who doesn't have power, right? That's right, yeah. And, and one of the most efficient, effective ways for us to use the AMI meter is if we do get a report of an outage and we're not sure if everybody's been restored. You know, uh, we, let's say we've restored power to most of the neighborhood, but we're not sure if the last couple of customers were on or not. Particularly in a storm situation, this can happen where there's a separate, a secondary nested outage within that, that major outage. We can connect to that meter and see if the customer has voltage. It's a manual process today, but it does help the, our uh, operators in the control room understand exactly who, who's been restored and who has it. Great point, Todd. Yeah, and that's exactly um, that's exactly what we're doing as well. Um, we have a fiber optic network of our own that connects all of our substations, and we've been pushing, as Duke has, we're pushing that connectivity via either cellular or, or fiber or whatever else we can do out to the um, out to other devices. We also do the exact same thing with AMI that the meter. Um, exactly what Michael said, is we can verify if somebody's got power to their meter base. Um, and that, that helps a bunch when a major storm figuring out if we got any stragglers out there we haven't connected yet. And this is David, I'll just add to everyone, uh, it kind of goes back into what I was talking about, how the utilities are starting to build these, these models to kind of start incorporating distribution planning. You know, it's not all cookie cutter type investments, you know, with all of this new data that's coming online, online, everyone will be able to kind of pinpoint where the most cost effective investment can be made based off of what challenges are being incorporated or seen in different areas. Thanks all for, for that. Um, I appreciate the conversation too. 
there's another question that came in. I'm hoping that this one can, sp so can spur some conversation too. And that's, can you discuss how distributed generation and energy storage impact resilience? How can you encourage distributed storage in a regulated utility environment where many of the attributes can't be monetized? And I think this gets to a broader question um, and that's what kind of policies or incentives do you think would further enable hardening and resiliency beyond DG and energy storage? And so whoever wants to jump into that, feel free. So energy and storage is still quite expensive. Uh, we're still at the beginning of the curve for um, mass adoption of energy storage. The, um, and if you, if you look at around 450, 415, excuse me, 415, $415 per uh, KW hour, it's still quite a bit more expensive than a, uh, a reciprocating engine, whether it's fueled by natural gas or, uh, or, or diesel fuel. The reciprocating engine can provide a resilient solution as long as you can feed it fuel. The energy storage system can only supply a resilient solution for as long as there's stored energy on that device, whether it's a flywheel or a battery. Um, there's other stored energy devices that are trying to make it these days, but those are the two most common today. Um, there are a lot of projects in Eastern North Carolina right now for energy storage, and there is a pretty good value proposition from the electric cities of North Carolina, the, the Municipal Utility Joint Action Agency. Um, Greg, I don't know if y'all are participating in it or not, but uh, we were working with a project with NCEMC for uh, Distribution Connected at the substation energy storage where they're testing out um, the ability to use that stored energy for, um, for resiliency. And what, um, what is the value proposition? I mean, what, what do the uh, capacity dollar payment have to be back to the entities that own these assets to make it worthwhile? We actually are participating in one of those projects, yes. Um, they have straight battery. We also, they've got some solar plus battery projects mm -hmm. coming on our system. Um, it's, it's also a great question. We have um, not not from us, we actually have some solar, I'm not sorry, some swine waste generators that are taking the methane off this swine um, swine waste and, and powering um, reciprocating engines off of it. Lots of questions, how do we incorporate that into not just a generator or into our, on our system, but a something to enhance resiliency. So if that rest of the circuit goes out, can that supply part of our customers during some interval, you know, um, during the storm or something like that? Um, it's one of those things, the, dig, the more you dig into it, the more questions there are and, and that monetizing it is, is really a kicker for this whole thing is how do you make this so that um, it's a viable business proposition for everybody. Yeah, to that point on the, the swine gas, uh, we're beginning a project in Maryland with a company that's gonna put renewable natural gas in the pipe to, uh, to sell into California. Um, so they're getting, north of $80 a decatherm for, for their gas. But to help the surrounding utilities, we're gonna put uh, natural gas generators in place that will also run on that, that RNG to provide um, capacity back to the grid for when the, utility, when the utility wants it. So it's probably the purest form of renewable on a, uh, on a reciprocating engine. I know that's kind of counterintuitive, but the, but the fuel is totally renewable. So from, um, I guess, a regulatory standpoint, where I would see a need to, or just an encouragement for storage would be to, I guess, try and figure out a way that policymakers can kind of better define what energy storage is or what its ultimate end, end goal is. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone on here has seen several webinars that kind of talk about different achievements that energy storage can do or functionalities that they can perform. But in reality, it's, I, don't, I don't know how many regulated entities or commissions or anything across the country have set specific rules on a type of technology like this that kind of 
specifically talk about storage as opposed to generation or other type of um, activities that get just tacked onto the grid. Um, but I feel like energy storage is almost an entity in itself and it just needs to get better defined in a regulated space before we can really start figuring out how to best monetize it for you know, future expansion. So what we're seeing most prevalent, I'm sorry, Michael, if you got something to add here, you go ahead. Yeah, thanks, uh, Todd. The, I think that's key to recognize that uh, as David kind of pointed out, we're still very early in the journey of adding DERs in general uh, to the distribution grid. Specifically, uh, I'll talk here about distribution. It could be a battery site, uh, and there's lots of challenges, for example, of how do we monetize that? That's the, the person who asked the question mentioned that. The way we approach it here at Duke is to develop some tools. We, we, we're still early in the journey. We're, we're developing tools that can really help us stack the value. So we can't really approach it um, from one aspect of what's the traditional solution to, let's say, an isolated community out there. You know, they have reliability issues because there's not an alternate source perhaps into that community. Um, there's a reliability value there. And we, we need to address the question of cost benefit from a standards wired solution, holes and wires to, to a battery solution. Uh, today, the costs are still pretty high for the battery solution, even at utility scale. So um, there's not always a, a clear winner there. So you end up in a situation where you really need to provide value to the distribution grid and you got to address any kind of value you can bring to, to the transmission system and to the generation system. If you could stack those and make a good business case, I think in the future we'll see more of those, uh, those projects move forward. And uh, as we learn and experience and operate these systems, we'll be able to, to pinpoint those costs and benefits better going forward. So where we see that the most across the country is where the utilities are offering uh, coincident peak. Uh, rate savings coincident peak tariff that the that the energy storage can operate on. So you know most of those events are an hour and a half to hour and forty minutes of duration, which uh, allows the uh, the use of energy storage. And then if you're very effective in predicting when the monthly coincident peak is going to be, it keeps the number of hours of operation uh, very low. Then if you can uh, actually charge the energy storage device with a renewable, then you're going to get ITC as well. So if you just stick with kind of a battery, um, if you could um, if you could use solar to charge it, keep your cost of the, the whole installation somewhere around $375 to $415 per uh, kilowatt hour, then uh, you're going to have a coincident peak savings across the country, somewhere in the 10 or $12 uh, dollars a KW on a monthly basis. That offers somewhere slightly less than a five-year payback on that installation. So is five years good enough? Uh, a lot of customers don't think five years is a uh, good enough uh, payback or a short enough payback period. So that's why I say the cost of the battery has to substantially uh, reduce because I don't think the value of that energy is going to substantially increase from the uh, from the utility from what we're seeing. On that issue of costs and benefits, Mike, uh, there's a question I think you're probably best suited to answer here about the Hot Springs microgrid. Um, can you see the Q&A or should I repeat it for you? I, I can see that. Thank you. Uh, it's a good question. Um, this is one of uh, Duke Energy. This is one of our first microgrid sites on the system. Uh, it's a DER site. It's up in the Hot Springs, uh, western part of North Carolina area in our DEP territory. And uh, as I was just uh, answering the last question, we need to think about it as we're still early in the journey there. Um, we are utilizing that site to learn about uh, how microgrids could work and how do we serve a community like that uh, with, with uh, a DER site. Uh, we have additional projects uh, that, that will help us understand that. One way to think about it is we have some infrastructure out there that is uh, pretty isolated. There's about 550 customers in the small town out in the mountains. 
And we have a, a limited amount of traditional capacity. Uh, think about the size of our substation transformer out there. Uh, and we have a large battery site there. So those things have to be well coordinated. And we don't want to end up in a situation where we're overloading the, the substation transformer with the battery that's charging or discharging. So there's some operational learnings there. Uh, and as we uh, grow over time, we'll, we'll learn more about the financials, the costs, the benefits, and uh, be able to think about things beyond the reliability of, you know, frequency regulation is, a, is a typically something that a battery site can provide for us as a vertically integrated utility. Thank you for that. Um, continuing through the Q&A, I have one question in my back pocket that I'd like to bring up if we have time, but I want to get through all the questions that are posed uh, to us first. Um, so there's a question about communication networks and whether they're affected during outages like AMI systems. Uh, the interconnected nature of infrastructure is something that some colleagues and I have been spending a lot of time in lately. Um, when utilities are, are trying to work on hardening and resiliency, are they also working on communication networks and other associated infrastructure? I don't know who best to put that to. Greg, maybe that's you, Mike, um, whoever wants to jump in on that. I'll maybe start on that one. Um, yes, the, the short answer is yes. We, we look at um, the various modes of communication uh, to all of our devices on the system. Uh, if we put AMI aside for a second, uh, we use the traditional types of communication networks. It's heavy reliance on cellular, third-party cellular companies. Uh, we have fiber to many of our substations. And we even use some uh, older technologies such as microwave to get to some of our remote locations. So uh, we do have comprehensive strategies around maintaining our communications networks and upgrading them to, to keep up with uh, the current technology. AMI is as a separate system. You know, we have a mesh network for AMI that uh, you have to manage differently and keep separated from the, the main system, but uh, we are con constantly looking at, it, at that as well and maintaining that system. Yeah, if I can jump in, and this is from Fort County standpoint, um, we have our own fiber network for connectivity to our substations. Our AMI system actually uses power line carrier. So it's pretty much as long as we have power in our substation, our, our AMI system will work. So that's not a separate cellular network. Now, obviously the trade-off is data transmission. You're not pulling as much robust data, but it's re really reliable and is reliable during storms. Uh, like Duke, we rely on um, cellular communication. We actually do have our own um, two-way radio system that we upgraded after Hurricane Florence um, because it wasn't performing. So we were trying to do that so we have um, not relying just on cellular, not just relying on our own two-way radios, um, not relying on any one source. So we, we are trying to make uh, provisions for redundancy um, in our communications. Thank you for that. Um, I think we have time for one more kind of around the room conversation. And I'm going to piggyback on this comment from this question from John. Is utilities plan for the future, are there good reasons or not to evaluate grid hardening or resiliency of existing infrastructure in the context of grid mod and future generation mix scenarios that include more renewables, storage, microgrids, et cetera? The other thing that I'll add on to this, there was a story in the Washington Post today about the stress that um, an increasing number of electric vehicles may be placing on the grid. Um, so how do we look to, so there's the individual question here, but also the broader context of how do we look to a changing grid, both demands and, and also supply in these resilience hardening uh, conversations? Whoever wants to take that. I don't know if there's a great answer to it. We we look at that. We're a small utility. Um, you know, some of what we need is is dis, it's got to be dispatchable. You know, if, if I'm going to plan that you're going to take this load off my system at peak periods, I've got to have some kind of guarantee, or I've got to build my my system to support that to support that load. I hope that makes sense. Is I can't you you know we can't have somebody come in and say we're going to take this load off the system. And I say, well, okay, I don't have to do upgrades. And then it's on there during peak periods, um, especially with no penalty to that. Um, and the other thing you got to remember too is um, upgrades are not always due to load. Um, 
age plays into this as well. At some point in time, you got to change out poles and wires just because they're old. Um, and there's not much you can do about that, uh, um, especially I know Duke, you know, the core 230 and 500 kV transmission system isn't going away in our lifetime. So, you know, they don't have the option of just saying, hey, you know, we can build microgrids and, and put batteries in the system and get rid of that system. And I'm not criticizing microgrids and that, but we are looking at them, but it doesn't, I don't see a future or foreseeable future where microgrids and renewables and batteries are going to, you know, obviate the need for upgrades and, and uh, on on the electric grid as a whole. But that's my that's my standpoint. That's not, uh, you know, I'm not sure others are going to disagree. Um, I'll add a couple just to just to add a couple comments to to Greg's thoughts there. Typically, when we have conversations about microgrids or, or DERs in general. The first thing we talk about is capacity, and that's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, it's it's pretty important for us to be thinking about those other elements to the equation. Um, there's things, uh, there's impacts to voltage on our system that come along with microgrids uh, in DERs in general. We have to manage that well. We have to manage that impact to our customers, uh, the rest of our customers on that circuit. So. Um, there's equipment needs that come uh, along with that responsibility, and there's um, technology needs that come along with that. So depending on the level of penetration, depending on the, the loads uh, that we're in the demand we're talking about, it can have different impacts to our customers. Solar intermittency is a good example. It's the classic example of, of impacts to other customers. So capacity is important, voltage is important, and operation operationally, um, how that device is gonna operate on a system can be very important. Greg mentioned the peak demands. Those are tr our traditional metrics, but we've got to learn how to do these other scenarios as well as, as these devices grow on our system. And just to add to that, it's kind of a little bit of what my, my slides were saying towards the end. It's, it's a combination of figuring out what we have and figure out, figuring out what we need. I mean, the utilities are planning on, on an abundance of different possibilities in their IRPs or just their typical planning in, ge in general. I mean, they have an obligation for lease costs, but they have policy goals that are being, they, that are being brought in. And ultimately they, had, they also need to, on top of those two very different, um, you know, plans, they have to make operation work, just like what Michael was saying. I mean, it, it's it's not easy, but it's definitely a challenge that you know we're going to have to come up with. The most rapidly growing part of our business is what you were saying, Greg, is that utilities are actually the ones that are putting these uh, distributed energy resources in place behind the customers meters that are dispatchable by the utility so that that now can either be part of their IRP or it can be um, something that they directly control and it's not to just affect our for customers to be able to affect their peak demand ratchet on a monthly basis but it's uh, to address system-wide load so that uh, they can suppress expense for all of their members, right? Because if you don't have to buy more transmission, you don't have to buy more on the spot uh, generation and affect that by curtailing the load, um, you are effectively helping every one of your members, not just the ones that, uh, that paid the money to put the resiliency solution in place behind their meter. Thank you all for that. I think that just about takes us to time. Um, so gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for your comments today and also the audience for the questions. Um, I believe uh, it's my job to now kick things over to Deb to, to round out the webinar. Hey there, Chris. Thank you. Uh, actually kicking it over to me, a little, little quirk here in the agenda, so. Um, thank you all, um, multiple things here. Um, for those interested in uh, networking with us virtually, um, and panelists, can you hear me? Did, will one of you make sure my computer's doing wonky stuff, so I want to make sure everybody can hear me. Um, 
Am I good? I hear you. Awesome. Thank you. I, I apologize. It's moving very slow on my end. Um, for those interested in networking uh, in, in networking virtually, um, we're going to transition to a different Zoom session. I just threw that Zoom link in the chat. Um, you can um, go ahead and join that room, and I will see you over there in about 60 seconds or so. But I really want to thank our panelists. Join me in a, virtually, a virtual clap, our moderator, and just a wonderful and great discussion about the, all the different aspects involved in, in maintaining and operating a grid. So thank you all very, very much for your time and your thought leadership. We're going to post this event um, um, on our YouTube page in the coming days so uh, others can see it. And in general, thank you all. And so as I say, let's transition over to our, our virtual networking platform. Um, I'll, I'll post the link one more time um, for everybody. Th that way we can all chat and uh, have our cameras up if we so choose um, and all that. So thank you all. I'll pause here for 30 seconds, 60 seconds to make sure people get over there and uh, uh, see you soon. <laughs>